episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with another really fascinating guest for you today, uh, helping to create a better tomorrow on many different fronts in the area of cancer and aging. Um, today, we are, are honored to be joined by Dr. Andre Gudkov, who is a, a preeminent cancer researcher who serves uh, as Senior Vice President of Research and Technology and Innovation, uh, Chair of the Department of Cell Stress Biology, and he's also a member of the Senior Leadership Team uh, for the National Cancer Institute's Cancer Center Support Grant at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. Goodcup is responsible for building uh, both the basic and translational research strengths uh, of the cell stress biology program, uh, focusing on areas like DNA damage and repair, uh, photodynamic therapy, uh, thermal and hypoxic stress, and immune modulation. Uh, he ex uh, assists their uh, president and CEO in developing and implementing a variety of strategic plans for new scientific programs, enhancing the collaborations uh, in research with other regional and national academic centers, uh, as well as with the industry. Uh, before joining Roswell Park, Dr. Goodkoff served as the chair of the Department of Molecular Genetics at Lerner Research Institute, a Cleveland Clinic Foundation, and was a professor of biochemistry uh, at Case Reserve, uh, Case Western. Uh, university, uh, earned his doctoral degree in experimental oncology at the Cancer Research Center uh, in Russia and the Doctor of Science in Molecular Biology at Moscow State University. Uh, he has authored uh, hundreds of scientific articles, holds uh, dozens of patents, uh, and when he's not doing all that, he is also an accomplished entrepreneur, uh, holds the position uh, of director and chief scientific advisor of Panicello Labs, uh, chief scientific officer at Onco Tardis, chief scientific officer for Everon Biosciences, uh, Genome Protection Incorporated, and chief scientific officer of Cleveland Biolabs. Uh, he is also on the board of Incuron LLC. Uh, and when he's doing all that, he is also the uh, founder and on the scientific board of a project called VICA, which is a nonprofit uh, charitable medical research organization with the mission uh, to extend the health and lifespan of domestic animals, particularly uh, focusing on a clinical study in the area of aged sled dogs. A lot to talk about, but uh, once again, Dr. Andre Goodcup, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to talk to us for a little while. Thank you for this generous introduction, Eric. Pleasure being with you. Yeah, Andre, it, it's great to see you. Uh, we, we got together about 18 months ago or so now previously, but I'd love to start things off like uh, I typically do by sort of handing you the floor for a few minutes just to talk a little bit more about uh, your background, a little bit more about where you grew up, how you got interested in oncology and molecular biology, and of course, aging. I think that'd be a, a great way to start things off while we'll begin assessing. Well, about <clears throat> a little more than half of my life uh, uh, was uh, spent in uh, s the country which does not exist anymore in Soviet Union. Uh, I was born <clears throat> and raised in Moscow and uh, graduated from mathematical school. Uh, was always interested in uh, biting and uh, crawling creatures uh, and uh, was not talented enough in mathematics and that determines my choice of profession. Um, I, um, I love, love wonder of biology and I didn't feel talented enough to be a mathematician, so that I have no choice but to become a biologist. Uh, the choice of uh, studying cancer uh, is not something which I planned, honestly. I was more interested in uh, taking, um, uh, you know, other trajectories, more like focusing on normal life uh, and uh, normal mechanisms and evolution. But then I quickly realized that in order to understand norm, you need to study pathology because it's the best way to challenge what norm is. <clears throat> and uh, uh, cancer is uh, probably one of the most uh, straightforward way to look at the uh, systemic mechanisms of uh, uh, norm because cancer is a systemic disease which challenges on one hand uh, all uh, systems of our organism, and we need to understand how it interferes with them uh, to start to find a way to cure. But also um, cancer uh, as a new evolving organism, which appears in us every time from scratch, has to pass through quick evolution. 
and uh, therefore in a very expedited manner mimic what we have been doing through millions of years of evolution. So to a certain degree, cancer is not only the pathology and disease, but also it's a fantastic model of biological evolution, mm -hmm. uh, which we can study. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and another thing is that um, I love to solve puzzles, uh, for, and as many of, you, of us, and uh, I like to read detective stories. Uh, when you have a puzzle and you don't know who is responsible, and then you need to find that one who is responsible to catch and punish him. <laughs> so cancer is the same thing. Cancer is a, uh, is a criminal. Uh, which, uh, and it's uh, every time it's a new criminal appears in our body from normal cells and understanding the mechanisms of acquisition of this criminal behavior uh, and the regularities of that and finding weak, uh, weak points, Achilles heels in, in this criminal behavior. It's a very um, passionate, I would say, passionating game um, mm -hmm. because <clears throat> the stake is very high. The stake is not only... Uh, you know, uh, the success and the pleasure of solving problem, but at stake is life of a uh, very high proportion of humans, including myself. So, And actually, exactly the same uh, was the driver behind our most recent turn in my career, which is, um, in my interest, I would say, is uh, turning into anti-aging research, mm -hmm. uh, because aging um, is even... Uh, even more universal disease than cancer, a disease with 100% of penetrance, as we would say. So there is not a single human in the world which would not uh, undergo aging. And uh, uh, our today's understanding does not provide us with their explanation why uh, we should age with such a such a you know, uh, accuracy and mm -hmm. why, what are the genetic determinants of that? Where is this timer of, which is ticking in us? And uh, finding this timer is a fascinating uh, challenge and very uh, exciting puzzle. And it's great to be part of those who are trying to crack it. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, you know, talking about um, sort of these timers, so, uh, you know, whether they're sort of the stress mechanisms that you, you focus on in cancer, but uh, you know, also in, in aging and the connection of uh, some of those pathways, but also um, this area that you, you, know, you have really, you're a major thought leader in and, and you've led sort of the charge um, in, in studying uh, the so-called retrobiome, um, you know, this fascinating area of these uh, ancient uh, genetic fragments that uh, over millions of years of evolution, as you uh, talk about, uh, you know, became incorporated in our genome, uh, once thought of as junk, but um, you've, you've been studying and, you know, have demonstrated that, hey, uh, when uh, they are desilenced, uh, whether that's based on certain damage or the failure of our immune system, and these things arise, um, they, as you put it, I think in one presentation, sort of systemically poison us over time. Um, take a look, obviously, I know this is a major part of your your research program, and you've, you've lectured extensively on this, but can you take us on a short walk uh, through a bit of your retrobiome work and a little bit of, I know there's many, you know, a couple different prongs in terms of how are you looking at the innate immune response to uh, surveil and, and, and find cells where these retrobiome elements have been desilenced, but some of your work in terms of finding cells, in terms of retrobiome management in general, uh, I think that'd be a very interesting uh, topic for us to delve into. Uh, no, sure. This is one of those <clears throat> things which I can uh, talk um, endlessly about because Please. I'm thinking about that day and night. Um, uh, indeed, um, you know, I think today we live in the era of pandemic. And today very few people did not convert themselves into virologists. Everybody has an opinion about viruses. Everybody is an <clears throat> expert in vaccination and uh, all over the world. So uh, to a certain degree, it makes me my job explaining the um, aging uh, hypothesis, which I'm exploring easier because uh, uh, people understand much better than they did um, like two or three years ago, yep. what viruses are and what, uh, what, what are the mechanisms of their pathogenicity and what are the approaches to counteracting their, um, their activity. So, um, 
<clears throat> we used to think about viruses as some uh, nasty outside enemies <clears throat> who are circulating in us and uh, clear parasites which do not deserve to exist. Um, during last uh, 30, 50 years, we uh, viruses which we experience as physiological subjects were joined by viruses which attack our computers. Uh, and uh, uh, I would say that the viral pandemic of different kinds which comes through computer viruses suspiciously resembles what we have in uh, physiology. So basically it's the same phenomenon, which uh, the reason I'm mentioning that because uh, during all this period when uh, we start observing the mechanisms of activity of living life viruses, real viruses made of nucleic acids and computer viruses made by computer programmers um, and the clear similarities in the mechanisms of their replication and pathogenicity. Uh, this is a great illustration that life is an information. So uh, we are all results of realization of <clears throat> information uh, which we inherited from uh, two uh, subjects, mother and father, um, and mixture of which uh, turn into translated into the uh, number of tens of thousands of proteins which cooperate together to form our body. The uh, sense of our existence is to replicate this information and spread it out. So uh, all living organisms on this planet they are carriers of information. So to a certain degree, they are all projects of certain informational uh, content, uh, which compete with each other and struggle for existence and try to expand this information. So far, uh, humans appear to be uh, the best project among mammals in terms of, well, I would say not exactly the best way. I think we are still can compete with rodents, with the rats and, and mice, but uh, we are among the best projects in, among mammals in terms of uh, spreading. And uh, um, we obviously uh, are winning uh, due to our uh, we clearly evolved and appeared uh, uh, intelligence. Um, and um, uh, well, but this, uh, line of thought about viruses being extrinsic nasty parasites uh, is somewhat uh, challenged with the fact that about or nearly half of our information which we carry in our cells uh, consists of viruses. It was formed by viruses. So uh, if you look in our genome uh, and uh, uh, in about the beginning of 60s people first discovered that very high proportion of our DNA consists of highly repetitive elements. Just the same type of words are repeated many, many times, sometimes millions of times. <clears throat> and uh, these repeats, they are, uh, exist in different versions. Some of them are uh, located as tandemly repeated repeats, such as cars in the train, mm, forming long stretches of DNA, which consists of this repeated, repeating elements one after another. We name this DNA usually satellite DNA, uh, and it occupies, if I'm not mistaken, up, about up to 10% probably of our DNA, maybe mm -hmm. with less. But there are also repeats which are dispersed, which are interspersed all over the <clears throat> genome, as if somebody took a nice book with a beautiful poem or a novel and put there lots of words of parasites uh, in a, almost every sentence in multiple places, making reading is really difficult. And indeed our organism, when it tries to convert what is written in our genes into proteins, which uh, we are, consist of, which are, we are built from, it has to uh, use a very sophisticated apparatus to machinery to find the senseful pieces in DNA, extract it there, translate it into RNA, splice out unnecessary parts, and only after that, this information can be translated into proteins. A huge amount of energy, time, and resources are spent by us by getting rid of unnecessary parts of our DNA. Uh, so finding sense in this, in this ocean of senseless repeats is some is every our every day's exercise 
our cells solve it every single moment of our existence and they and uh, I nobody can calculate what proportion of the energy which we are getting by eating uh, food for example and um, uh, it is consumed to to um, basically resolve these problems of text mm-hmm. of spoiled text turn the spoiled text into sensible text uh, I can say but I believe that very substantial proportion of energy goes into that. Uh, uh, Another very substantial proportion of energy, of course, goes uh, to defense from uh, bacteria and viruses, which always try to uh, eat us um, as uh, competing, information competing with us. But then we suddenly realize that a lot of this interspersed repeats which altogether, all this uh, DNA occupies uh, nearly 50% of our mammalian DNA. Uh, we, uh, well, for a long time already <clears throat> know that they uh, appeared, amplified, expanded, and stayed there as remains of ancient viruses. Yep. Um, these viruses, as we can reconstruct it today, uh, many, many millions years ago could spread out as we name it horizontally, meaning uh, passing from one uh, one subject to another. Uh, but today they don't do that. At least we don't know about this. Um, we know that these viruses, uh, well, first of all, most of them are dead. Uh, dead means uh, uh, during these millions of years of existence, they acquired so many mutations that they cannot really be functional. They are spoiled by this uh, mutation. Uh, they, <coughs> they, rot- they rot. However, s- small proportion of them are still technically alive and uh, would continue expanding uh, there by creating new progeny, which invades into new areas of our DNA constantly if they would be allowed to do so. Fortunately, however, uh, we, uh, we are surviving because through this long evolution, we found a nice evolutionary agreement with these viruses because we are interested in keeping being alive and they're mm-hmm. interested in living in us and not, not mm-hmm. being annihilated together with a host, sure. right? So we, we, both parties had to find some coexistence uh, terms, some agreement. And these terms are, I, uh, we, we cannot get rid of them because we don't have the mechanism of cutting them out and just throwing them away. But we have another mechanism. We can keep them silenced by not allowing them to be recognized by a transcriptional machinery, by machinery which can start synthesizing the RNA. They are hidden by so-called heterochromatin in the uh, proteins which are wrapping DNA so tightly mm-hmm. that a machinery which needs to recognize them simply cannot reach DNA in these areas. So this is the, our part of evolutionary agreement. We keep them, we keep them asleep. Mm. Well, but um, sometimes, unfortunately, because it's not they're technically alive, uh, even though there are not that many of them, um, desilencing can occur because this uh, this uh, mechanism of, as we name it, epigenetic silencing, is not working with it working very accurately. But we have about several trillion of cells in our in us, and some cells make mistakes. <coughs> The moment uh, we, the moment we have these elements alive and activated, we this cell's fate immediately changes, and uh, what is happening in this cell we know really well at the level of the single cell. We understand less what is happening at the level of the organism, but we can do some reconstruction <clears throat> at the level of individual cell. The uh, activation, what, what is happening? This repeats, this ancient viruses, starts producing uh, RNA. And this RNA uh, encodes only two proteins, one of which is the protein which can synthesize on this RNA, uh, DNA copy of the same RNA, which and then drives its incorporation into back into the genome, into an absolutely random site. That's it. That's the whole... Uh, the whole <clears throat> the replication cycle of these primitive viruses. They synthesize RNA. This RNA encodes uh, the protein, which is named reverse transcriptase. Uh, uh, for the discovery of reverse transcriptase in 1975, 
David Baltimore and Howard Tamman received Nobel Prize yep. uh, because <clears throat> it was discovered in, in, retro element, in, in retroviruses, including uh, HIV, by the way, belongs to that category. Sure. Uh, and uh, But these viruses, which I'm talking about, they're also driven by this class of enzyme named reverse transcriptase. And this reverse transcriptase has uh, many functions. Not only it can synthesize DNA on the template of RNA, which is reverting uh, flow of genetic information, because normally we have DNA, RNA protein. Now we have one step reverted, RNA, DNA. Um, and But also it can drive integration or incorporation of this DNA into genome, which uh, unavoidably leads to the necessity of making breaks in DNA, right? So it has uh, activity which uh, creates DNA breaks, so which means that activation of this virus in the cell creates cell with very high degree of DNA damage. And DNA damage is a recipe for acquisition of mutations because the more you damage DNA, obviously there are mechanisms of, uh, of DNA repair, but DNA repair not always be accurate and mutations can occur. So activation of retro elements in a single cell resembles, uh, resembles planting inside the cell a piece of uranium or radium mm -hmm. because they <clears throat> constantly becomes under pressure of DNA damage. This DNA damage is not limited by holes in DNA which need to be repaired, but also this incorporation of new elements in the new places of DNA can dramatically change activity of those genes which are in the vicinity of integration because the gene can be interrupted by itself or its regulatory region can be modified and the gene would start working differently. The importance of these events is illustrated by some very interesting results, which are not very well advertised, but I would like to um, explain that to you now. Sure, please. <clears throat> um, well, I probably, um, uh, I'm coming to the point which is very important. Yes, I started from cancer and aging, but I need to make um, one step back or one step, step aside to explain something and then come back to my main topic. Please. Um, when you look back in evolution <clears throat> and trying to look uh, what was the dynamic of appearance and occupation of our DNA with these elements, it appears that their occupation was not a constant process. It's not like they appeared and then gradually accumulate. Mm -hmm. Uh, very accurate reconstruction of evolutionary events, which was done, and I don't have time to explain how it was done, but trust me, it was done in extremely accurate manner. I trust you. <clears throat> that um, this process of accumulation of these uh, elements, which all together formed this word a retrobiome, which you used, which has not been yet accepted as a general term, but I love it. I kind of invented that and I keep using it. So um, uh, this retrobiome was formed as a mm, sequence of very big explosions. So that when one element starts exploding and creating hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of new copies, <clears throat> which almost for sure meant uh, appearance of genetic catastrophe that that particular species where this event start occurring, it was a pandemic if you wish, but it was not pandemic in terms of spreading virus from one person to another. It was pandemic in terms of appearance of freaks in the progeny, right? Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it, and uh, when uh, that, but appearing of freaks, malformed animals in the progeny is not always bad. It's bad when we are adapted very well and there are no changes of environment. Mm. But if there is a changing environment and we need to get adaptation to new conditions of life, Having genetic variability is a plus. Sure. Yes, 99.999% of freaks are going to die and they will be uh, have disadvantageous changes. But the very rare circumstances, you may gain some functions which uh, did not were not needed in the previous conditions, but now become needed in the new conditions. That's how evolution works. So which means that mm, the uh, appearance of new traits, of new morphological features or physiological features, uh, almost always is devastating and uh, jeopardizing normal life, but in the rarest cases can create new, uh, new forms of life. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that this reconstruction 
brought us to a very interesting conclusion that uh, we all enjoy coming to the zoo, right? Why? Because we are fascinated with the diversity of forms, giraffes, uh, hippos, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, bears and the size of that and uh, elephants, you know, uh, yeah. whales, you know, uh, morphologically, mammalian world is so enormously diverse uh, and it looks almost looks like a wonder. <clears throat> and uh, we never th frequently, we, we're not, usually not thinking what is the driving force for this diversity. But if you look in evolution, again, re looking at reconstruction, and if you compare DNA of, let's say, a whale and a man, or uh, a bat and uh, a dog, uh, or elephant and, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, a rodent, something like that, you would be surprised that you will find very small differences in the gene content. Sure. There are no genes of wings, no genes of fins, you know. We all have pretty much the same genes. They simply uh, simply turn uh, themselves, translate into morphologically distinct uh, features, but they are, foundation is the same. So, the, which means that it's like music. Music uses the same notes, right? The same sounds, but composition of these sounds create a new motif, right? The same thing is here. Uh, but who is the conductor? Who is the... Uh, who is the uh, person who is the um, creator of the music here? And it appears that the creator of the music were retro elements. Because uh, if you compare uh, genome of uh, rodent and human, gene-wise we are the same, but we are completely different in right. terms of the nature of our repeats. <clears throat> and today's reconstruction allow us to predict and to explain that about 100 million years ago, when uh, there were about um, still multiple species of mammals on this earth, according to paleontological evidence, there was no big diversity. The zoo at the time would be very boring <laughs> if it would be consisting of mammals. Sure. It will be beautiful dinosaurs there of different kinds, but mammals would be enormously boring. They all would look pretty much the same. And then suddenly, suddenly means still within several millions of years of evolution, but on evolutionary scale, it's not a long time in a very short time, you suddenly appear, the whole zoo appeared. And after that, there were no big inventions. So all this diversity of mammals, which I listed recently, appeared about uh, 50, 60 million years ago. And since then, no major evolutionary creations were made. Yes, within each order, there were uh, changes like dolphin, you know, and whales, they somehow diverged or like a rat from mm -hmm. a mouse or hamster, you know, apes from human and so on. But these were already, I would say, uh, kind of uh, adaptation to different areas of existence. Mm -hmm. not, not major evolutionary creations happened since then because there were no major explosions of, of that same scale of repeats which happened then. So this is, you may say, okay, this is a reconstruction. Who knows whether it's true or not? And I can tell you, we do have proofs that they are still walking like that. And uh, the um, proof of that, which we have, is actually running and barking around us every day and is in pro almost every family now. These are dogs. Yep. Why dogs? represent a nice illustration of the activity of retrobiome as a creator of morphological traits, of appearances. Yeah. I, will, I will explain it very easily, but before I explain that, I want you to appreciate one thing which people usually do not think about, that dogs represent by far the most amazing diversity of forms within one species. Yeah. You know, Small Chihuahua and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Irish Wolfdog, they are, differ in size uh, <clears throat> almost 50 times. Uh, when you photograph them and show, saying that they belong to the same species uh, would, <laughs> would look really very strange idea. Yeah. Nevertheless, they do belong to one species. They, moreover, they recognize each other kind of species. They mate and they uh, create progeny. 
So, uh, but nevertheless, they give this such amazing diversity of forms. And you may say, okay, humans were just very uh, fond of making new breeds and they uh, put lots of effort into uh, making this diversity. This is true. But at the same time, humans domesticated horses, donkeys, camels, cows, um, uh, and uh, never the, and they pigs, and they tried <clears throat> as much as they did with dogs uh, to, to, to make different types of morphological creatures. They succeeded somewhat. We have mini pigs, you know, we have uh, so, some other versions of breeds of horses, but nothing comparable to diversity of dogs. Uh, cats, I forgot, of course. So, uh, and you may ask, what is that mysterious explanation for this mysterious fact that uh, why dog are so, uh, dogs are so, pl so, so high plasticity? Obviously, genetically determined because every breed of dogs is inheriting these traits, right? People who were uh, analyzing these um, uh, principles, the, this, uh, trying to address these questions, they did the following work. Uh, you may choose a single most uh, uh, characteristic trait of certain breed. Let's take short legs of Dachshund or Corgi, right? Uh, and it appears that the same mutation determines this short leg appearance. This mutation was first mapped on the chromosome by uh, simple uh, genetic screening and uh, identification of those parts of DNA which are inherited together with this trait. And then this area was sequenced. We can read every single uh, nucleotide in that area. And we can compare it to dogs with a normal sized legs. And what we found is that this mutation is the appearance of a new copy of retro element in a new place. <laughs> so, which means that the presence of this retro element a changed morphology, so it played the role of morphogene. Yep. It did not really change the uh, DNA uh, of the which encodes the protein. The protein may be the same, but its level of regulation changes. And the ratios of, it's like changing the tone of sounds in the music, which create motif. Or, and the, so that's exactly what happened here. And I provided only one example, but there are multiple examples in dogs demonstrating that pretty much every time when people bothered to identify genetic event behind the uh, certain morphological trait, it uh, has always been uh, identification of certain retro elements sitting in a new place. Mm -hmm. So explanation for high um, uh, ability to uh, create diversity of appearances in dog formations, in dog morphology is explained in a simple way. Dogs have very active retrobiome, which is insufficiently well uh, suppressed. <clears throat> and as such, it creates lots of freaks and malformations. And humans picked those freaks if they like their, how they look and turn them into breeds. That's exactly what happened 50, 60 million years ago when there was a creation of a zoo of mammals. But that was an experiment done by nature. Here, experiment also done by nature, by picked by us in, the, in real time. So to a certain degree, evolution of dogs is a great example when microevolution mimics the macroevolution uh, in, in the past. That is, by the way, that's the reason why we are focusing on dogs and created this Vika uh, uh, dog aging project, because yep. now I'm making a big loop and returning back to aging and cancer. Please. Uh, and, um, mm, well, carrying this dangerous load in our genes always comes with a price. Sure. Uh, so far, I tried as much as I can to highlight the um, positive things of these things. They are drivers of diversity, drivers of evolution. But, you know, none of us in real life wants to evolve. <laughs> we, we don't want to see evolution in our children. We don't want right. to be born as, uh, with malformations and defects, right? We hate this. Humans would love to stop evolution as much as they can because evolution every time <clears throat> is massive extinction after which only a few uh, successors, you know, um, uh, survive and then give rise to a new, uh, new, new form of life. We, our attempt today is to stop evolution. Uh, people, we never say this in these words, but let's be honest, we try to do that. 
we are struggling with genetically modified food. We are, you know, intuitively, we're trying to do whatever we can. And obviously religion did it all the time to, to stay, to stabilize our DNA and to stay with what we have today, not improving it. Yep. Eugenics was prohibited and still prohibited in majority of cancers. Experiments with stem cells are prohibited. So we as a society, as humanity, we're doing based on our, let's name it ethical standards, which in reality is a more like religious type of standards to stop evolution uh, as much as we can and live with that load which we carry. So, and one of the reasons for that, and there are plenty of reasons for that, uh, one of which of course is that uh, uh, the ability of each cell in our body to evolve by activation of retro elements can uh, lead to cancer because uh, uh, they, um, the, only, the only selective pressure which can, uh, uh, can reveal itself uh, at the tissue level is appearance of the cell's ability to <clears throat> have to unconstrained growth and unconstrained divisions. And uh, this certainly can be provoked by any type of mutagenesis, including mm -hmm. mutagenesis caused by retroelement. So uh, the, the very first thing people are thinking about when they think about retroelement desilencing is that, oh my goodness, they are drivers of cancer. And this is true. We already have plenty of information indicating that this is true. Moreover, <clears throat> uh, if you think uh, about the reasons why we are being killed by cancer, uh, it's not because cancer appears. It, uh, the cells with unconstrained growth appear all the time. In sure. all, all these, you know, uh, uh, kind of nevi uh, and uh, 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 well, pl plenty of uh, plenty of uh, hyperproliferation areas we can see now. Skin, for example, sure. uh, very very few of them turn into cancer. Why? Because we developed through evolution numerous anti-cancer mechanisms, which eventually prevent growth of such cells. And uh, one of which are intrinsic mechanisms, which work in every cell, because every cell has a finite number of divisions allowed. Uh, and normally, unlike tumor cells, which have to get rid of this mechanism, but there is also immune system. Immune system is made to recognize and uh, kill um, those cells which happen to be genetically unstable. <clears throat> Since I am talking today about this intrinsic mechanism of genetic destabilizing uh, activity of retro elements, uh, obviously our immune system evolved to recognize such cells and effectively eliminate them. Uh, if you cannot stop something, you'd better kill the cell, the source of that, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think everybody uh, today have heard about interferon system, right? Sure. Interferon is part of innate immunity, which uh, was developed <clears throat> and, act and gets activated when there, are, there is a viral attack. Uh, and there are plenty of mechanisms how the cell wakes up interferon response by finding the presence of the virus. Remember that presence of the virus is not a very trivial thing to, to find because viruses so closely and so intimately resemble our mechanisms and use the same proteins, yep. that it's not very trivial. So how the cell can recognize that retro element is activated? And we know not all the mechanisms, but some we do. Uh, for example, remember I told you that these retro elements, they amplify by creating DNA in cytoplasm on the template mm -hmm. of the RNA. But think, that, think about that. Our cells have nucleus and cytoplasm. Nucleus is the place where we keep our DNA. Cytoplasm is the place where this information gets translated into proteins. Yep. So cytoplasm has only RNA and nucleus has DNA and fresh RNA, which is synthesized on that. Yep. Virus, when it synthesizes DNA in the cytoplasm, creates a new situation. DNA appears in the place where it's supposed not to be. And immediately we have a guardian there named CGAS sting pathway, which is there to recognize appearance of DNA in cytoplasm. DNA in cytoplasm equals for our cell appearance of the virus. And it doesn't care which DNA it is. It may be DNA, you know, completely non-viral DNA, but interpretation will be that it's viral DNA mm -hmm. and uh, the cell will start activating interferon response. 
What does it mean from the point of view of the cell? Several things. Some cells can be killed in suicidal manner by this activation. Sure. Some cells can activate uh, inflammatory response, so they become inf inflamed. What is inflammation? Inflammation, we only immediately think about, uh, you know, high temperature, fever, uh, unpleasant, uh, you know, uh, flu-like uh, uh, symptoms and mm -hmm. so on. This is inflammation. But inflammation is an alert of immune system, right? Yeah. Sure. So all these feelings, not because of disease, it's because of the immune system gets alerted and it does preventive measure not to allow infections to spread. So we can, and the, when the cell gets inflamed, you don't feel it because it's so tiny, but it creates a little, uh, a little uh, kind of change in its microenvironment because it starts secreting bioactive factors which attract immunity, saying, find me, kill me. <laughs> I am bad, I have virus. So that's exactly what is happening. And uh, uh, our, now I'm coming to the major hypothesis which we are based on. We believe that the process of desilencing of retrobiome with a low probability is happening in uh, rare cells in our body, spontaneous. This is translated into the induction of inflammation around the cell. And these cells are effectively being killed by immune system. And we see the indications that it's happening. With age, what happens that we have more and more cells with this type of activation, and we have less and less capable of immune system to, to clean our body from that. So the misbalance happens because of a exhaust of immune system's capability of eliminate cells with uh, active retrobiome and their mm -hmm. gradual accumulation, which is translated to systemic chronic unresolved inflammation. Today, uh, I think all gerontologists in the world agree that systemic chronic, systemic inflammation is an essential component of aging mm -hmm. and the mother of majority of age-related diseases, including cancer, arthritis, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, and many other diseases, uh, cardiovascular diseases. So, if this is true, if this is true, then uh, if this equilibrium is broken because of aging of immune system, impotence of immune system developed with age, and you may ask why immune system gets impotent, we do not know it, but there is a good chance that it's happening also because of the accumulation of cells with uh, retroviral integrations mm -hmm. there. We have indications of that too. So, and... Um, uh, also accumulation of these cells. So therefore it gives you a recipe, at least hope for the, for cure on prophylaxis. Of course, only the success of this cure prophylaxis will be the ultimate proof that we're on the right track. Mm -hmm. But uh, we cannot wait, we have to test it, right? And there are several ways to do it, but there are two principal ways to do it. Exactly like with COVID pandemic right now. COVID pandemic can be stopped by either vaccination, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that directing immunity against those cells, which it cannot effectively kill otherwise. And the second thing is to use antiviral drugs. Those which would, for example, inhibitors of reverse transcriptase, which would not allow uh, <clears throat> these viruses, even after desilencing, synthesize DNA. And both of these uh, directions are being explored by us. Um, the uh, first, the second one, which is inhibition of reverse transcriptase is, I would say much closer to the ultimate testing mm -hmm. of, uh, simply because we as uh, humanity, we have developed uh, multiple reverse transcriptase inhibitors to treat such viral diseases as HIV. Yep or uh, hepatitis B, which both of these viruses uh, use reverse, their own reverse transcriptases. And there are inhibitors which are, have broad enough specificity uh, to uh, also inhibit reverse transcriptase of our own origin. So, and uh, of course, um, testing these things in context of aging, we would not have enough time to survive until we know whether it's um, 
uh, it's going to rejuvenate us or not. But we can try it on dogs. Sure. We can try it on rodents. And we can try it on cancer patients because, as I said, cancer is the model of evolution. And this evolution, to a certain degree, is driven by retrobiome activity. We may be able to see that uh, the cancer would be uh, responsive to this, uh, this type of treatment by uh, slowing down its evolution. And this is the trajectories we are taking. The immunological approach is also extremely fascinating because the um, immune system uh, is so powerful tool that um, uh, it has multiple capabilities which can be recruited to improve those parts of immunity which are not working very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, vaccination against uh, cells, uh, expressing that is another direction. Yeah. So uh, these are two directions which we are exploring in our research here at Roswell Park on in company Genome Protection, which yeah. is a spin-off located nearly 150 yards from here. And we already have uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors uh, working specific for line one elements for this endogenous uh, viruses already working in animals. We already have uh, mm, running the clinical trial in uh, mm -hmm. uh, in dogs. Uh, we, as we, as you mentioned, we have a uh, hundred retired sled dogs collected in Ithaca in the University of Cornell University uh, School of Veterinary Campus, uh, and we are studying them, be treating them with reverse transcriptase inhibitors, comparing with those who are receiving placebo. And uh, um, we are developing vaccines as well. So, uh, and these are the, and of course, uh, we're just starting the clinical trial in humans who are being treated against uh, small cell lung cancer, one of the most uh, uncurable forms of cancer today, yeah. very high speed of evolution. And uh, these patients will receive on top of standard of care reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which would allow us potentially test to what extent we can improve their progression-free survival. Yeah. So this yeah. is a long story, but I think I covered it most of the things I planned. It, it, it's, it, it's such an elegant story, Andre, everything from you know, you, you, the retrobiome to cancer to aging, uh, multiple therapeutic uh, paths. And then obviously, you know, you're bringing, you know, you were the first at bringing in, you know, the larger animals in terms of the VICA study, um, the ability, as you are saying, to, we have these FDA approved products already. Let's see what we can do in the clinic. It, it's an elegant story. It's fascinating. I know I love hearing you talk about it. Um, the one other place, I, and I have a very busy schedule. One thing I, I, I wanted to talk to you about also because it, it, it made a big splash recently a couple of weeks ago, and I, and I hope you could talk about it for a little bit, uh, was this study um, that you were part of in, in Nature Communications, uh, Longitudinal Analysis of Blood Markers Revealing Progressive Loss of Resilience mm -hmm. and Predicting Human Lifespan. Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, and and, and in, in this paper, you know, you bring up this, this concept of the dynamic organism state indicator. You're looking at a variety of, of different data sets, artificial intelligence involved. Um, I know this is separate from everything else you're doing, but um, the, the, the topic of sort of monitoring aging, as you were you know, talking about before, you know, we can't sit around for 50 years studying aging uh, in a clinical study, but some of these really unique uh, ways to integrate multiple biomarkers and other physiological tools to understand uh, biological re resilience, human aging. Talk a little bit about this paper, if you would. Uh, yes, thank you for, uh, <clears throat> for, for, for noticing it. It's, uh, uh, it was, it, indeed, it was a very interesting piece of work. Uh, and uh, it was done uh, in collaboration. My role there was the role of a biologist who interprets the re results of pretty sophisticated mathematics using the uh, most modern mm, tools of in artificial intelligence and uh, um, you know, modern statistics. Uh, uh, to analyze <clears throat> huge data sets accumulated by uh, analyzing blood of people uh, routinely. You know, we are routinely giving blood for analysis for, 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 for different types of diagnosis or just for um, health check. And all this information is accumulating in, uh, uh, in the service uh, organizations which are doing this sort of like quest for example right sure. so um and um, many of this uh, these data sets they're invaluable in terms of 
uh, how much hidden information they have. Of course, due to ethical reasons, we absolutely do not want and we cannot get access to the <clears throat> exact individuals who are behind that. But we can get access to this information in the identified manner, yep. in, in the form of um, uh, just blood, blood parameters. Uh, and the only information we have is about age, about sex, and uh, about uh, duration of life. So uh, for many, <clears throat> uh, when you, the, uh, this paper is based on the analysis of a huge amount of information. Uh, and of course, we're also based on lots of studies on mice. With mice, we, can't, we, we don't care about that. They're identifying them. For mice, we, <laughs> we know their names. <laughs> so, um, and uh, this work was based on the analysis of a huge amount of data uh, accumulated in one of the um, major uh, contract uh, research organizations doing routine blood testing, uh, which uh, covers tens of thousands of people, uh, from many of which analysis was done longitudinally, multiple times during during their life. And for many of them, we already know uh, what is their, uh, how, how long they live, because unfortunately, some of them are already dead, because they were, many of them were very old. So, um, and uh, knowing this information, and there were several other things, such as smoking habits, you know, some other information available. Uh, and uh, uh, the analysis of, the, of this huge amount of information brought us to the following concept, that uh, aging as a reduced capability of solving problems, solving challenge, physiological challenges, is uh, actually can be defined as a loss of resilience, mm -hmm. gradual loss of ability to return back to norm following stress. Yep. Well, um, we all know that how easy we are when we are young, how quickly we can uh, recover following wounding, for following flu, uh, other viruses, you know, or bacterial wow. infections. We know how much more dangerous and difficult they become when we age. Uh, we know how much more dangerous COVID, for example, is for older people. And there is a very clear, clear gradient. The older you become, the higher chance of lethality or severe consequences. So this is all uh, because of loss of resilience. Uh, and uh, um, our life, can be uh, metaphorically projected, and in the paper we even provide a figure of that, as a, a ball which goes down the road, uh, which rolls down the road in the gutter. And the gutter is a slope, right? Mm -hmm. and this gutter has the walls which are very, very high in the beginning, but the, the further the ball is running, the lower and lower the, uh, the walls of the gutter. And uh, diseases is the, uh, when you push this ball, uh, you know, perpendicular to its, uh, to, to its trajectory. So if the gutter's walls are high, it will make a movement like this and then turn back into the mainstream, right? But when the uh, gutter's walls become very low, the same degree of devastation would lead to much more severe and much longer lasting dis destabilization. That's exactly what is happening in our life. Uh, we came to the conclusion collectively as a field that aging is not a combination of age-related diseases. Age-related diseases develop because they, uh, there is loss of resilience. And uh, we need to separate these two things together uh, from each other. We can, you can cure all age-related diseases and still die from aging itself. <laughs> Because uh, age-related diseases are executors of death. They are not aging themselves. And uh, therefore, mathematically, it became possible to separate healthy aging, aging with no diseases, as loss of resilience, and age-related diseases. When you separate them, you can see when your life can reach the point when the resilience would be completely evaporated to zero and every disease would kill you. And the number which we received based on these projections is between 120 and 150 years. So that's the time 
when human organism, according to the dynamic of processes which are ticking in us automatically, would reach complete loss of resilience and will die from anything. It's a, it's a fascinating paper, and I, um, I, I really uh, we don't hear it as much as we should, in, in my opinion. But this 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 concept of resilience in comparison to sort of damage and other things that are going on is just so extremely <laughs> integral in this big picture. I I, um, I I very much appreciated this paper, and, and it, I, I was I was the only one that read it. It, it, it got a lot of chatter throughout the uh, the uh, the longevity uh, network. So I, I I was excited to to see it, and of course you involved with it. Um, uh, I mean anything. Um, I, I mean I know I, I uh, since the last time we talked, I I, I kept following uh, you and PubMed and, and, and some of the other. Uh, literature databases you've been doing a lot the last year and on the oncology side um any other major things coming up uh, any obviously we're coming out of the pandemic now uh, but uh conferences you're going to be speaking at talks that we should know about uh, please i'm just going to hand you back the floor uh for a wrap up anything i didn't touch on that you want to uh specifically talk about in terms of your program and your lab at Roswell. i thank you for asking um, <clears throat> for, for, this, for a scientist, uh, the most important way of disclosure, of course, are um, peer-reviewed publications, uh, uh, because that's what is left after we die, right? Uh, uh, that's something on what other people can stand on and continue moving forward. Therefore, speaking at conferences and uh, presentations and doing all these type of things is only it's something which can accompany what we do, but most important, the publication. We are preparing right now a series of very important uh, publications which cover some of the topics which I told you about, including, mm -hmm. including the activity of retrobiome in dogs, uh, including the mechanisms of activation of retro elements and their translation into inflammation, mm -hmm. um, uh, in, including the role of retro element activation in cancer progression. So these things will, uh, we hope that within next year we will see them published and uh, um, some of them may be interesting enough to the public and will be highlighted in um, in chats. But there is one thing which I probably would love to mention um, because it may may have some practical outcome. I told you about aging of immune system. And again, today we, I'm sure that almost everybody of us knows people who died from COVID. Uh, not in me, maybe if not in immediate family, but at least in some families, you know that. I know sure. quite, quite a few. In vast majority of cases, these are old people. Uh, and uh, mm, the reason it's happening is because of this aging immune system, the term we are using named immunosenescence. Mm -hmm. Immunosenescence is manifested is lack of ability to be vaccinated. So, and, and I can tell you that immunosenescence is equally happening in every mammal we tested. Mm -hmm. So uh, mice, uh, mouse live uh, in our animal facilities about two and a half years. And they die from, not from diseases, they die from aging because they live under ideal condition. Sure. And when they reach about year and a half, you can't vaccinate them. They stop responding, they stop developing antibodies. That allowed us to study what we can do to wake capability of sleeping immune system to get reactivated and we found a reagent which can be given to the mouse and return it back to the ability to be vaccinated and this is the reagent which we have been developing for years uh, and uh, as a radiation antidote the uh, something which can be given to lethally radiated mammal and uh, increase chances of survival the reason we started testing this strange idea bit what is the is because both radiation and aging associated with acquisition of cells with damaged dna and with uh, in, in efficient immune system so that similarity pushed us to try uh, what if radiation antidote would work as a rejuvenator of immune system and when we tested that we saw very clear signals in mice that it does occur that it happens that it does induce uh, immune responses in animals which otherwise are completely deaf to the immune stimulus. And uh, being uh, inspired with these results, we are running currently a clinical trial in Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, 
with uh, uh, Robert Pignola as a principal investigator, mm -hmm. the leading hemat uh, gerontologist there. Um, when we are giving a shot of this reagent named entolimod uh, to uh, people who, who are coming for vaccination against flu, and some of them receive placebo and some of them receive uh, uh, the entolimod together with a flu shot. And when we unblind the results after this study is completed, we'll be able to see to what extent the uh, def deficiency in ability of immune system to be vac to active, being activated by a vaccine is restored by entolimod. If it happens, it may have a very, very big implications because yeah. uh, I don't need to explain much about that. Yeah, it's uh, the immunosenescence theme has become <laughs> such such a major topic. Of course, the last year, I I I happened to when I was uh, uh, reading up on you for the last couple of weeks, getting ready for the show. I saw some of the uh, the write up, I think, in the patents and so forth on on this really exciting reprogramming of these senescent uh, immune cells. So really. Really fascinating work, Andre. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always excited about what you do. I love to follow your work, and I encourage, obviously, anyone that's going to be watching uh, this episode or listening to uh, uh, to Google, go into PubMed, uh, follow Dr. Gugov and his work because it really is uh, cutting edge stuff in the big picture of cancer and aging. And um, yeah, Andre, I just want to, you know, once again. Uh, it's amazing. I, I'm wishing you the best with with all these programs, including Vika, including the uh, you know your your exceptional work of doing human translation, which you know so few <laughs> few folks are actually doing nowadays in the aging space. So really exciting um, uh, for for everybody that's uh, is going to be listening to the podcast or watching uh, on uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, you've been listening to Dr. Andre Goodcuff, uh, Senior Vice President, of Research Technology. And Innovation uh, Chair of the Department of uh, Cell Stress Biology and member of their senior uh, leadership team at the Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, Andre, as always, it's, it's great to see you. I, I want to thank you again for, for taking the time out of your schedule to give an update on everything you're doing. Uh, obviously, thank you for doing it. Uh, and as we like to say on our show, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow uh, on all of these fronts through your work. It's, it's really very uh, inspirational and, 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 you, and you do an amazing work. And really thank you for your time. Thank you, Ira. It was my pleasure and uh, I'm pleased to talk about something which uh, makes sense of my life. Thank you.